Welcome to Screw the Commute, the entrepreneurial podcast dedicated to getting you out of the car and into the money with your host, lifelong entrepreneur and multimillionaire, Tom Antion. Hey, everybody, it's Tom here with episode 486 of Screw the Commute podcast. We are in Vetpreneur Month here at Screw the Commute every September. We really honor our veterans and military folks because I couldn't be doing this and you couldn't be probably doing what you're doing if it wasn't for them keeping us safe. And uh, we really want to thank and highlight those uh, great people that are doing great things in the world. And we've got one here today. We've got Travis Johnson. He had, <laughs> I would, I don't want to laugh about it, but I would say a rough childhood. And, and I mean rough. 36 moves before graduating high school at 17 years old in six states, five foster homes. And listen to this, surviving two murder attempts, one from his mother and one from his sister. And the only way I can make any sense of that is that that lady, when she tells you to clean your room, you better clean your room. I'm telling you, I don't know. He's going to tell us what happened there. Jesus. What a thing. And he turned out to be so wonderful and helping so many great people that are doing great things to help people. It's crazy. So I don't know how he got the uh, intestinal fortitude for that, but we're sure going to hear about it. All right. If you'd like to get big affiliate commissions from me, just email me at tom at screwthecommute.com and we can get you into our affiliate program. And you can make anywhere from $8.50 that you can blow at Starbucks to in excess of 5,000 for a one speaking engagement. So, and everything in between. So you can make a real good money from uh, referring our stuff and we never get refunds because we take care of our customers. So, so uh, give me an email at tom at screwthecommute.com. Pick up a copy of our automation ebook. This ebook has allowed me, or the techniques in the ebook have, has allowed me to handle up to 150,000 subscribers and 65,000 customers without pulling my hair out. And just one of the tips we actually estimated a couple years ago has saved me seven and a half million keystrokes. Definitely saved me carpal tunnel syndrome. So grab a copy of that at screwthecommute.com slash automate free. Screwthecommute.com slash automate free. And also pick up a copy of our podcast app at screwthecommute.com slash app, that's A-P-P, and you can put it on your cell phone and tablet, take us with you on the road. We got, you know, a lot of people give you an app and then you got to try to figure it out. Well, we have complete videos and screen capture to show you how to use it. Now, I usually tell you about my school now, but I've got something way, way bigger going on. We're doing a pilot program to help persons with disabilities not only get trained in a highly in-demand skill, which is internet and digital marketing, from home so they don't have to travel, to getting them hired and or start their own business or both. So I really want your help with this. You know, I've raised a lot of money for dogs and homeless children and all kinds of things. And as I look back, I'm really proud of those things, but I kind of look yeah, you know, it's kind of like a Band-Aid that, you know, what happens to those 500 kids uh, after a year that I fed them and uh, what happens then, you know? So so in this case, I want to change somebody's life forever before I kick the bucket on this earth. And uh, and the, the idea is we're going to help five people get hired or start their own business. And we're also going to use some of the money to uh, hire persons with disabilities to run the program. And then I'm going to roll it out really big. I'm going, I took a grant writing course. I'm going to go try to find big money to help lots of people. And then that's going to be one of my legacy projects uh, for the world. So if you can help out, that'd be great. Uh, check it out. Uh, everything will be in the show notes at imtcva.org slash disabilities. That's plural. Click on the GoFundMe campaign. Anything you kick in is great. And if you're really flush with cash, you can sponsor a person yourself. So just get in touch with me about that. So that's the story, and I'm sticking to it. All right, let's get to the main event. Travis Johnson is here. He's a Navy guy, and uh, he's going to probably look funny at me when he finds out I turned down an appointment to the Naval Academy. Oh, yeah, I did. I couldn't. Uh, I saw those guys jogging to class. I thought, uh, <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> so but anyway, 
He's uh, got the Nonprofit Architect podcast. Travis shares his perspectives as the former vice president of Books by Vets, and he's a board member at the Shine Foundation and a benefactor of 20000 bucks, I guess, of his own money. He's a volunteer with 1,500-plus hours of volunteering. He's really paying it back and paying it forward, and he's helped raise more than a half a million dollars. So, Travis, are you ready to screw? The commute. Absolutely, Tom. Thanks for having me on the show today. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure, man. Boy, uh, uh, had a little bit rough in the beginning there, huh? You know, I, I kind of feel bad for all the disadvantaged people out there that had smooth sailing <laughs> childhoods. They didn't know how to build any perseverance, fortitude, or dedication growing up without all the problems that I had. So really sorry out there if you had a great childhood, you're, you're starting a leg behind and I I really do apologize for that. You know how true that is because so many people, you you just say boo to them and they like collapse like there's somebody just stabbed them in the eye. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not a parent, but I see a lot of this stuff going on. I kind of act as a reporter and these, you know, these kids nowadays, any kind of pressure, they just fold, they turn to drugs, alcohol, gangs and cry, crying and safe spaces and uh, I, I wouldn't wish uh, your extreme version on anybody, but if you can make it uh, put some pressure on kids, I think it's going to help them in the long run. Oh, absolutely. And really, when you're in this kind of situations like I've had growing up, it really helps you to stay a little bit of objective and kind of defer or deflect some of these terrible circumstances just for a few moments to give you that chance to really see what's going on instead of just really experiencing what's going on you see you can look at my childhood and see the terrible things that happened and and here's the deal when you have some kind of trauma like that or experience like that it's not your fault but here's the deal it is your responsibility to get healing and take action and move forward in your life regardless of what happened to you we can keep pointing the fingers at other people and depending on where you are in the political spectrum you point them at different kinds of people but i know without a doubt that it's really hard to get the whole rest of the world to go to therapy to fix your problem. So take care of your personal healing and take responsibility and move forward. Jeez. Now I can't, you mean, I can't keep blaming my mother for me being an overeater. <laughs> I don't think you so. can. I don't know how it's going to help <laughs> yeah. you. You certainly can, but so, uh, wow. Yeah. So, so I understand that, I mean, something was uh, over, you know, looking over you, some kind of force or power, because you were like, like one year away from having a felony conviction. Was that, is that true? Yeah, there's uh, you know, when you go through these type of events and you're trying to figure out where your place is in the world and you end up getting angry and blaming either yourself or the people around you trying to you know, figure out your way in this world and, you know, made some poor decisions. Fortunately for me, my, uh, you know, conviction for my bad behavior when I was younger was about four months before it could really, really hurt me, uh, which I'm very thankful for the timing on that. And then based on the good I've done in the service, I provided this nation, I've you know gone back to court to get that removed from my record, but just so fortunate uh, that the timing worked out to where it didn't hurt me for life. Now, the same type of offense committed by other people, this is going to be a lifetime requirement, uh, regardless of what degree of terribleness that you committed, this thing is uh, going to stick around with you for the rest of time. So fortunate to have this happen in my life and my world before it became a lifetime requirement. Exactly. And uh, so how, uh, coming from that kind of background, how, what mechanism, it's just hard to imagine what mechanism could help turn it around so starkly in your case where you decided to help out organizations that there were so many that helped you as you were bounced around all over the place oh yeah absolutely you What's know when I, got the end, when I got to the end of my high school career trying to figure out what my life was going to be looking like and for me it was my faith the opportunity that the navy provided me and uh, my girlfriend at the time which is now my wife who you get to meet during the little pre-interview warm-up phase, um, you know, all three of those, they didn't care who I was or what happened. They just cared about what I was and who I become moving forward. So, you know, not having the best grades in high school, obviously with a lot going on, it's really hard to focus 
on school, I didn't have the best grades. And because of the behavior of the family, mother having bipolar disorder, every time that we moved around or got bounced around is because she needed treatment. It's also the reason that she tried to kill me growing up. So you don't have the best grades. You don't have the best family name. And then coming from trailer parks and foster homes, you don't have any money. So it's incumbent upon the person to try to find a way to have some kind of advantage in this world or, or get into an organization that's going to give you some kind of opportunities. And I knew the military had these opportunities. My dad came to me. He was like trying to offer me a job at the local community college to be a, um, a maintenance guy. And at the time I was working at Burger King as a shift supervisor. I had graduated high school. I would go work the lunch counter across town. This is in, in Northern Minnesota where the food's actually good at the bowling alley. And then I go to Walmart every day and I would unload truck and stock the shelves from 5 p.m. to two in the morning. And I did this five days a week. And I was like, dad, I don't need another job. I've already got three jobs. And he's like, well, get rid of those three crappy jobs and get one good job. And at the time I wasn't making more than nine bucks an hour at any of these jobs. And the offer at the community college was like 18 bucks an hour to start, which wow. is a fantastic place to start. But I took the advice, but not the job. And I joined the Navy to give me some opportunities, a chance you know, have some structure and growth and get around some people that didn't know all of basically my dirty laundry and be able to grow within their structure, their organization, their core values. And that allowed me to really create who I wanted to be as a person. And with the support of my wife, you know, fortunately for me, every time something for my career came up, she would say, I was like, what should we do? And she'd always answer whatever's best for your career. That's what we're going to do. Wow. And, you know, her love and support and, and guidance for all of that, along with our, our strong faith really helped propel me into the person that I've become. Amazing. Do you still have any um, relationship with your mother? I do. You know, the fun, the funny thing is that when someone has a mental illness and they actually are working on themselves, taking their medication as they should, doing the things they need to be mentally well most days, it's kind of easy to have a, a relationship with those kind of people. It's the other side, like my sister, who is not taking responsibility for her mental health and taking the steps she needs to be a, a decent human being. Well, I don't have a relationship with her. Well, then in that case, we're not having her on the podcast. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so now with all that, uh, that background, somehow you channeled this into working to help nonprofits raise money and, you know, lots about the operations of nonprofits and uh, this isn't really a nonprofit show, but, but tell us a little bit about if somebody did want to have a nonprofit What's the ins and outs of it? I know when I took the grant writing course and I found out that 90% uh, of the money out there is going to go to nonprofits. But then when I started looking into nonprofits, I think I've heard you talk about this before. I thought, you know what? That's too much hassle for me. You know, maybe I could team up with some other nonprofit, but uh, for me to run one, I, I said no. So what are some of the pros and cons of that? And then a little later, we're going to talk about how you promote all this stuff with uh, your podcast. Sure, absolutely, Tom. The, the thing about startups and where people are coming from is they're really coming from a place of wanting to help and create impact. And when I got started in the nonprofit world, I finally got kind of past that scarcity mode, that survival mode, and, and was able to start making an impact in my community. And I didn't know what to do. It was like, I, I knew that I could show up and have a good attitude and want to help, but I didn't really know what it meant to be part of a community because I had bounced all over the dang place. So I started asking people in church, I'm like, what do people in the community do? How do you become part of the community? Like I didn't know, I didn't understand uh, because I, I had only been able to focus on where's my next meal coming from? Where's my paycheck right. coming from? What do I need to do to take care of my family? It was the very, very, very basics for so many years until I got to the place like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not fighting for these things anymore. I have these things. So what is, what does it look like next? And got introduced to some fantastic people and got invited to be on the board of books by vets and the shine foundation and, and raise a bunch of money and got stationed in the kingdom of Bahrain of all places and wanted to do something productive. I just enjoyed uh, all of the time I got to spend with the nonprofits in person, you know, looking back at my history, all of the people that helped keep me sheltered, clothed and fed all of these years, you know, how can I provide a give back and a way to, 
really show my appreciation. I started by volunteering and giving some money and different things. And when I got stationed in Bahrain, I was like, how am I supposed to keep doing all this cool nonprofit work while being deployed? So I actually started my podcast, the Nonprofit Architect Podcast, while deployed to the Middle East and knew that I knew some stuff, but not a lot of stuff. And I looked at the top shows out there in the nonprofit world and kind of looking for a gap. That's what we do in the, the entrepreneurial world, right? We look for gaps and ways to make this impact. And no one seemed to be doing a nonprofit show that really taught the how-to, the behind the scenes. And that's how we kind of came up with the idea for the Nonprofit Architect podcast. And I know listeners to your show have been going through the entrepreneurial journey and learning how to do that and just how tough it is. Well, the nonprofit world is just as tough, but also- I thought you the don't money just the... rains in. As oh, yeah, yeah. You... you start it up and you just hit yeah. a button and the money just starts pouring yeah, out. Yeah, I thought it was, uh, you know- uh, yeah. Super easy, easy. right? Yeah. But <laughs> not not at all. And I know we're I know we're joking here. You've got all the difficulty of being an entrepreneur, but you've got all these extra requirements levied to you by the state and the IRS. So you start your own business, you own your business. You start your own nonprofit. After the first day, you are listed as the founder, but you don't own this thing. You will actually have a board that you report to, a board of directors, and they're responsible to the community for the execution of the mission. So just right off the bat, right after starting these things, there's some pretty stark differences between the business, the for-profit business world and the nonprofit. Yeah. Business when I world. found that out, I said, wait a minute, you mean they could kick me out? I guess. Yes, they could. Huh? There, there is a lot of people out there that have been removed as a founder of an organization. That's not their baby. And they decided the board is like, you know what, we're going to go in a different direction. And unless you're on board, it's not going to include you. <laughs> oh man. And that is so heartbreaking for a lot of people. And there's a lot of founders that try to put language into the bylaws to prevent that from happening. I'm actually kind of a fan of that behavior, the, the ability to be fired, because if you're no longer in alignment with the mission, then what are you doing? I get that. But, uh, you know, you put a lot of sweat and blood in, in there and maybe, maybe the mission has should change, but I guess that doesn't count with the IRS. <laughs> You well, you can you can file it. paperwork to update your mission statement, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But you need to agree upon it between the the founder and the the board of directors, right? Yeah, I think I'm too much of a control freak for that situation. <laughs> <laughs> so so many of us are. There's a reason you know that I don't currently have my own nonprofit right. organization, right? But when you're looking at this, what I find a lot is that people just really want to help. And they currently believe that the best way to help is to start your own nonprofit. And that might be true. But what we would like to do is we like to make sure we're starting off on the right foot. So just like starting a business, you do your research, you figure out what's out there and what can be provided. I did an interview with Candice Leozu from Foster 360, and she was in the business world, really wanted to help out kids aging out of the foster care system, which, of course, I am a huge fan of helping those people. And I was like, well, how did you do this? She's like, well, I looked around. She's in the Phoenix, Tempe, Mesa, uh, megalopolis down there in Arizona. And she looked around and she found out that there was tons of organizations uh, helping foster kids age out of the program. And she was so excited. There was hope that this group of people was being helped, but she was trying to find the gaps. And what she found was, is that kids in the foster care system that get bounced around from house to house to house being treated the same way as adults and getting bounced around from program to program to program. So what they created is they created kind of a navigation system. They, they would pair you up with a mentor and when they would help you walk through all these programs that are needed to help you navigate the system in the real world. So you're paired up with a mentor that'll help you do that. So you're not getting passed around anymore. So she found that although there was a lot of services being provided for the foster care uh, kiddos that are aging out and becoming adults, she found the gap and that they were not being handled the way that she would expect. So they created an organization underneath the United Way in that area as a program and really, you know, leveraging the United Way and being able to help these kids. So you can find the gaps that are exist in your community for the people that you want to help, or you can find people that are already doing the thing that you want to do. You can help them or if they're serving the people that you want to serve, maybe you can be a program director and help that specific 
type of person in a specific way. And you can do most of those things without starting your own organization. So really understanding what the need of the community is and how your desire to help is going to make the greatest impact. That could mean starting your own nonprofit, but understand that it might take you three, five to 10 years to make the impact you want. Or if someone else is already doing it, you can become a board member, a volunteer, a donor, or a program director and start making an impact today. Well, what's the, what's the actual mechanism? Like, for instance, with my thing, like I said, I'm not a nonprofit. I'm actually not taking any money out of the school. I'm still using um, GoFundMe and, you know, crowdfunding to fund the program so far. But when I want to roll it out really big, uh, what's the mechanism? Like, you say, hey, United Way, look, I got this great program. I proved that it works. Uh, give me some money or how, <laughs> how does it work? Well, there's there's a way to create that partnership or that program under an organization like United Way. And this is a conversation you would have to have with them and their board and what their vision is based on what they're working on to see if that's a good fit. If you're going to do this on your own, the super basics of this thing is you incorporate, you get your tax EIN, and you create a board of directors. You get it usually three non-related individuals, and then you file something called a 1023 EZ form with the IRS with COVID right now. It's taken about seven weeks to get your paperwork back to say if you do or do not have 501c3 status. But there are also many types of different status. It's not just 501c3, it's 501c6 and a whole host of others based on what type of organization that you're trying to create. So there's a few different ways to do this. Now, what I meant but, was, is if you are clearly not a 5013C that wants to partner with one that is as a program director, like you bring the program to them, say, hey, I got this program and this is what we've proven to work and we want to roll it out bigger and want to partner with you. Isn't that um, a possibility? It's, ex it's exactly like you're describing. But just like you would make any other type of pitch or try to create a partnership in the same way you would approach an organization doing this. So you really you, want to, you don't have to do the 1023 EZ or anything. You, you're clearly already a corporation. You're already in business running this program and you're just a separate business entity trying to go under their umbrella. Well, you don't even have to create a business entity. Oh, okay. If, yeah. If you, if you know what you want to do and how you want to do it, and you convince an organization that that would fall under their mission umbrella. Mm -hmm. it, it's just as simple as, as standing that thing up, creating whatever agreement between you and the host organization and what that might look like. For some people, that works great. For other people, they find out that they don't have as much control as they would like, or they're not able to do it exactly the way they want to, where they don't, you know, not seeing eye to eye with the founder or the board. So they might decide to go off on their own, or they find an organization in another state is doing the exact thing and they create a branch in the state that they're in. Mm. So you are not starting from, it's almost like franchising. It's not like, it's not the same thing, but you've got the organizational structure, you've got the rules, you've got the name, you've got the branding recognition, mm -hmm. and you would probably be raising the money to file in your state on your own under them. You would do the paperwork with them in your state and you would be running a chapter of oh, their organization in your state. I yeah. See. Yeah. So there's lots of potential methods rather than starting your own 501. Was it C3? Yeah. C3, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. There's, there's so many different ways to get involved and to make the impact. And when you look at what it takes to really be a founder and, and create essentially a movement on this thing. And if you're, obviously talking to a lot of entrepreneurs here that are trying to do their own thing. Either they're working and trying to create a side hustle to turn that into their main hustle. You're putting that much work into it. Only when you're starting this organization, just like in the entrepreneurial world, you're the janitor, the CEO mm -hmm. and everything in between. Employee the month, also, every month. <laughs> you know, absolutely. And then you uh, have this fundraising cycle where depending on how you do it, and we teach you how to create monthly recurring donations. So you're not trying to play 12 one month games a year. Instead, you're trying to lower your fundraising bar each and every month because you're having recurring donations come in. But you're trying to do all of these things and raise money and do your mission and get your board to get their button gear 
to train them how to do it. So you need to learn how to organize and run a 501c3. Then you've got the IRS requirements. Then you have to, every dollar that you spend or bring in has to meet your mission. If it doesn't, you get taxed on Mm -hmm. this thing. So there's an astronomical amount of rules, regulations, and things that you have to follow on top of really being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it sounds daunting. Um, I'm definitely going to go the other way. (laughs) That's for sure. Partner up with somebody or just keep on my own. But but you've been very successful in helping folks raise more money and and tell us how podcasting has worked into this. I heard somebody on there recently, I can't remember her name, but like the queen of fundraising or something, but she was quite dynamic about all the ways she uh, raises funds. Podcasting, as you know, and hopefully some of our guests understand, is such an amazing tool. We had blogs that are taking out and destroying newspapers. We've got YouTube that's crushing TV and cable. Now we've got podcasting that's really taking over radio and as a, essentially a free tool to get your message out there. If you do something like I'm doing, when you do an interview show like Tom's doing, I don't have to do a lot of the work on my show. I bring on the guest. I ask questions that I put all the onus, all the work on the guest to come up with the answers like Tom's doing to me right now. Mm-hmm. But every every single person you interview, you you gain knowledge. It's like hosting your own private masterclass with them for free. You get to learn all the things that you want to learn based on who you bring on as a guest. Like I've had Steve Sims on the show and Bob Berg and Asha Curran, who's big in the nonprofit world. She runs hashtag giving Tuesday and they brought in $2.47 billion on a single day last year, which is just astronomical. But every person I interview, my credibility goes up, my knowledge goes up, my reach goes up, my audience goes up, and I'm able to leverage and build these relationships with people. And all of a sudden, I'm someone to know. I'm offering my platform as a way for them to spread their message, to get good, solid questions answered, and to build this thing. If you're in the nonprofit world, you can now interview your local, city, state, and federal politicians, bring them on your show, ask them about the type of things you're doing and what they're doing behind the scenes of the legislation to support what you're doing. And on the flip side of it, now when this comes up in their session, they bring in you as the expert to leverage your knowledge and expertise about what this is. When you put your podcast on your website and you end up using it to create content, you don't have to figure out what the heck you're going to post each and every day. You pull audiograms, little audio snippets out of the episode. And if you ask at least five questions, you now have five questions and answers to use as content on your website, on your social media and everywhere else. The beautiful thing about posting your podcast on your website is it lets you know that Google is like, hey, I see this guy's updating their podcast each and every week with new material, sometimes twice a week, sometimes more with a podcast blog or vlog. Your rankings are going to go up right now. If you put down your phones and you Google nonprofit architect podcast, you're going to see that all of my stuff is the first four and a half pages of Google. Yeah, I, I did. And uh, and I, I got the same kind of stories. Well, you're on here and Vetr- Vetpreneur Month exists because I interviewed one guy <laughs> and it got me invited to the White House. I spoke at the Military Influencers Conference, uh, you know, and then, you know, you see I'm on episode 486 with you i've covered a lot of people that have made a lot of breaks and i learned a lot i had a lot of people referring my products and services for commission you know so just all kinds of great things come from it, it it's it's such a beautiful tool and the nonprofit world instead of you having to go to organization after organization after organization to spread your message with each person that you interview and they share the episode and they help promote it on their behalf as well as your behalf now, all of a sudden you have donors, or if you're in the entrepreneurial world, you have buyers or clients coming to you instead of you going to them. Can you imagine not being able to take any new meetings with donors this week because of all <laughs> the d- meetings that they have set with you? Yeah, I want to give you money. Well, sorry, for? there's too many people in front of you. Just hold off. <laughs> yeah, can, but can you imagine saying no to those things because you have so many people coming to you, want to help you with your mission? It is just a fantastic way to really... And I hate to say flip the script, but it really changes the flow of information and the flow of people into your sphere of influence. All right. So you have some training on this, right? Oh, absolutely. You know, we started doing the nonprofit gig and and helping out nonprofits. And uh, from starting this thing, it hasn't even been two years, Tom. I'm not sure what day in, in September this is coming out, but September 23rd this year will be two years 
of operation of the podcast. And within three months of starting, we shot up to number four in the U.S. And now we're top five in five countries right now, including the U.S. and Canada. And I started getting more questions about podcasting specifically than anything else. And it led me to writing an ultimate podcast guide, which is a, a couple of bucks online. But there's, if you're interested in this all, there's a freebie you can grab at nonprofitarchitect.org slash resources. It's the 15 reasons I think every nonprofit entrepreneur consultant needs their own podcast. It's a, it's a free to you. It says like a dollar on there. There's a, a code in there. It says free 99. If you mess up putting in the code, you're out of buck. So not that big of a deal, but uh, you know, pick that up. It's actually turned into one of the biggest revenue generating streams of the business that I run here. And the demand was so high for this thing that they, people immediately started asking like, Hey, where's the course? Where's the course along this? Well, right now, uh, just like our friend Stephen Kuhn and Joel Stewart, I'm creating a how to podcast course for Forbes Business School. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I don't want to brag now, Travis, but I just got word yesterday that we're number 42 entrepreneurial podcast in Kazakhstan. <laughs> the, the, the only bad part about it was last last week we were number 40 so we dropped two two slots in Kazakhstan. where the heck that is so uh, we got to take a brief sponsor break when we come back we'll ask travis uh, what's a typical day look like for him and um, how he stays motivated so folks uh, about 23 years ago i kind of turned the internet marketing guru world on its head and that guys like me were charging 50 or 100 grand up front to help you and i knew a lot of these guys are ripoffs so that if you give them 50 grand up front they'd be hiding out in kajikistan or wherever it is <laughs> and uh, and so i said you know that's not that's too risky for small business and not fair so what i did is i charged an entry fee and then i charged a percentage of their profits that's capped at fifty thousand. So for me to make my 50000 they had to net 200000 <laughs> Well, people kind of loved this, and 23 years later and 1,700 students, it's still going strong. We have a very unique program. It's the longest-running, most successful, and most unique ever in the field of Internet and digital marketing mentor program. You know, we have a, a retreat center. It's a big mansion. You, you actually live in the house for an immersion weekend. We have a TV studio here where we shoot marketing videos for you. And again, we're, oh, you know, I'm not going to disappear on you because I want my 50,000. So, so that's the nature of our program. And it allows me to do things like I'm doing with the school. We have, you also get a scholarship to the school. It's a $19,100 tuition to my school. And that's included in the mentor program that you can either use yourself or gift to somebody. So uh, very unique, very powerful, long running. I'm not disappearing on anybody because guess what? I want my 50,000. So, so you know, I'll be here. So uh, that's the story. Uh, so please um, check that out at greatinternetmarketingtraining.com. And then don't forget our, um, our legacy program for these uh, folks with disabilities. And check that out at my school, imtcva.org slash disabilities. All right, let's get back to the main event. We've got Travis Johnson here with us, and he's hey, quite an inspirational guy, the way he uh, was able to turn around his life from a beginning that most people couldn't even imagine. So we're really proud of him uh, for that. So what's a typical day look like for you now, uh, Travis, and you're working the business and the military and everything, and how do you stay motivated? I tell you what, that was one of the hardest things to figure out. When I was over in Bahrain, I'd have my watch cycle where I had to be at work and, and everything else was my free time. My, my wife and kid stayed back here in Oklahoma city. So I was out there by myself, really oh. needed the podcast to, you know, keep myself out of trouble, make sure I was doing <laughs> something positive and productive. Cause it's, it's easy to get distracted when you don't have, you know, oversight of like, I don't know, your wife and kids. <laughs> so I was really scheduling as much as I possibly could get away with trying to meet people and learn the industry and figure out podcasting and, and really how to find my voice, you know, it takes a couple, uh, 10, 15, 20 episodes to figure out even who the heck you are as a host, if you're not used to hosting things, but you know, typical day, I finally got it kind of figured out. I'm working roughly every other week for the Navy on a full-time shift, 40 hours. And I have my daytimes 
locked down in a couple of days. I've got Mondays and Wednesday mornings where I dedicate to pre-interviews, podcast interviews, whether I'm the host or the guest. Tuesdays, I have a dedicated day off to use for extraneous things like catch up or to uh, dedicate a day to golfing and making sure I'm doing something that I'm passionate about having fun with so I can make sure to keep my motivation up. Thursdays, I really dedicate to uh, my personal learning and training. I'm part of a couple of mastermind groups and part of a couple of clubhouse calls that I get on on Thursday and really kind of fill my, myself back up. And then Friday is a free day and I don't, I never schedule anything on the weekends, kind of take it as it comes kind of guys So really dedicating time for the podcast slash business things to only Monday and Wednesday mornings. But do you have any kind of a morning routine or do you get up early? Do you exercise? Do you, what do you eat? I mean, you really want to know what the life is of uh, uh, an entrepreneur. It, it really depends on the week. The weeks that I work full time for the Navy, I, I roll out of bed, you know, scratch and hop on the laptop usually. And I am doing showering and eating and different things in between calls and interviews. And on the weeks that I have off, I start my morning off the same way, jump right into the things I need to accomplish. And it's not till usually after lunch that I get time to go to the gym and, and things of that nature. Uh, right away when I wake up and I'm the most creative, I want to be talking to mm -hmm. people and keep that excitement and energy going because everyone that hops on my calendar fills me up, fills up my personal tank. So that really gets me going and running. I don't talk to anyone that's not excited about their passion and what they want to do and the things they want to talk about. So their passion helps fill me up. Well, that's, uh, that's great. Now you were highlighted in a book called walk with warriors. Tell everybody about that. Yeah, that's my first author experience. I know you've got uh, Joel Stewart running Reagan. He's the author of what, like 35 books <laughs> yeah. since like March or something like that. Poor guy. <laughs> this is, this is just crazy. Cause when I went to figure out like how to connect with the community, I ended up joining the local chamber of commerce. And at this time I didn't have a business. I just wanted to be connected with people. I just, again, show up with a great attitude, willing to help. And they put on a, a bowling event. Well, I had been to bowling nationals uh, three different times and I bought my, brought my bowling equipment and I was like, you know what, I'll bring my stuff. And if, if someone needs a fourth or whatever, I'll just hop in with these guys. And, and sure enough, I showed up and my friend, Jamie Crow was like, Hey, actually these people over at such and such bank, they need a fourth. If you want to definitely plug you in make the introductions and hang out with them. Well, I did. And I got to meet people at a local bank and, and talk about some different things and, you know, hung out afterwards, even though I didn't know what the heck I was doing. And Jamie at the end, she was like, hey, you're in the military, right? I said, yeah, absolutely. She's like, I've got a friend, Shannon Whittington. She's putting together an anthology. She's getting veteran authors to write their story. Do you want me to connect to you? I said, absolutely. And I sent Shannon a message. I was like, hey, are you still looking for authors? She's like, we are. And I need 3,000 words. And you have till Friday. <laughs> <laughs> and me, I love rising to the challenge. You want to, you want to get me fired up. Tell me I can't do something or that it's nearly impossible and just watch me go. And I woke up the next morning, two straight hours. I put 3000 words on paper, sent it off to her. She came back with two small edits and got me added to the book. I loved what she was doing so much that she was actually running an organization called books by vets. And I said, well, what can I help with? Do you need board members? Do you need donors? Do you need volunteers? Tell me what you need. And she said, yes, I need all of those things. So I was the first person she brought in for her nonprofit to be on our board. And we created the 501c3 and we helped 50 authors get published and share their stories, which is just a phenomenal thing to do. But Walk With Warriors is 22 different veteran authors sharing their stories. So you can hear some of the behind the scenes and things that I've talked about in this interview laid out. You can find Walk With Warriors on Amazon. The author, the primary author is going to be Shannon Whittington because that's just how anthologies work. Mm -hmm. Pick that up if you want to. I don't get anything from it uh, other than the fact that you knowing that you get to see 22 vets share their incredible stories and, and what they've been through in different aspects of their lives. It's a great opportunity for those, those authors, for sure. So tell everybody again how they get a hold of you. And then I want to end with a, uh, a quotation from one of our favorite generals. So, <laughs> so go ahead and tell them how to get a hold of you. Sounds fantastic. Thanks, Tom. If you go to Linktree, Nonprofit Architect, you've got all of my links, all my social, my website, everything that I have, Linktree, 
nonprofit architect, or just punch in nonprofit architect into Google and connect with me on any of the first four pages. You'll find my website, Facebook, LinkedIn, or nonprofit architect at gmail.com. Yeah, now isn't that the linktr.ee, something like that? That's absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah, so- linktr.ee slash nonprofit architect. Yeah. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, if you just type it in, you won't go anywhere. I think you like Mad Dog Mattis. I've heard you uh, quote him, right? That's right. Well, my favorite quote, yours was on communication. Maybe we'll talk about that next time. But my favorite one is be polite, be professional, and be ready to kill everybody you meet. <laughs> 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 yeah, be polite, be professional. I have a plan to kill everyone. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I like to quote him as well. I generally a little bit tamer on the nonprofit yeah, side. He's got a he's got a phenomenal three step communication mm-hmm. process. It's what do I know? Who needs to know? Have I told them? Yeah, because so many people say get mad because somebody didn't do something and they never told them that they even wanted them to do it. It, it is so straightforward. It it goes to every organization, any type of entity. I had a, a guy I interviewed, I was doing like a pre-interview with him. And he was like, Travis, I'm so frustrated. I, you know, I don't feel like I have any support. I actually got up on stage in front of my supporters and I told him I was mad at them. I was like, mad at him. Why were you mad at him? He's like, he's like, no one's sharing my stuff. No one's you know, giving to me financially. No one's doing this, that, and the other. I said, Hey brother, quick question. Did you tell them the best way to support you. And he said, what do you mean? I'm like, did you say, Hey, thank you so much for being my network. The best way to support me really, really, really want you to engage with me on social media. If that's commenting, if that's sharing a post that to me will have the most direct impact for me. And that would make me feel whole and wonderful as an organization. If you support us in that fashion, did you tell your people that? And he's like, no, I was like, so you yelled at your group of people for not supporting you. And you didn't tell them how you would like to be supported. And he's like, I didn't. And now I feel terrible. (laughs) And you should. (laughs) (laughs) It is, it is just that simple. I know generally speaking, men are more direct than the ladies are women. If you are out there and you're like, yeah, I don't like being that direct. That's how men operate. If they, if you say, Hey babe, go do the dishes before work. I can do that. I can absolutely do the dishes before work. If you say, Hey babe, the sink's kind of filling up. That just means to me that that sucks. <laughs> if there's a pile of dishes. You didn't tell me to do anything. So I don't know what you want me to do. And I know like, well, that's not exactly how it works. And well, you know, <laughs> guys like being direct. So do your folks tell them what you would like them to do. Please connect with me on social media. LinkedIn is one of my favorites right now, but you're going to get the most updates on Facebook. Connect with me. Ask me questions. Join my group. If you're in the nonprofit world, you got questions, ask the group. I'm not always available, but the group is there to help you answer your questions to get you moving down this road. Post your struggles, post your questions, post your successes. Let us celebrate with you, please, please, please. Because so many times do we forget to celebrate the little stuff. That's right. And I think both of those quotes from uh, Mad Dog will serve you well. <laughs> Absolutely, so, Tom. Absolutely. So the nonprofit architect, Travis Johnson. So thanks so much for coming on, man. Hey, thanks for having me, Tom. I really appreciate it. Okay, everybody. We'll meet you uh, next issue as part of Vetpreneur Month on Screw the Commute podcast. Catch you later. 